Nancy Fry is an authority on the road to Santiago and a leading professional guide. The story of James actually starts what we know about him from the Bible. He was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee with his brother John, John the Evangelist. They were one day, they were mending their nets, and Jesus comes up to them and says, Would you like to join me in my work and become disciples? And they do. James the Greater becomes the fourth apostle of Christ. The apostles are sent off into the world to preach the word of Jesus. James is sent off to Spain to preach the good news. He has quite a difficult time. Well, he has the dubious honor of becoming the first apostle to be martyred in 44 AD at the hands of Herod's Agrippa. His head is chopped off. His two loyal disciples gather his remains and they put them into a stone boat. And that boat is set to sail. It sails through the Mediterranean and lands on the Galician coast. So once his body is brought to shore, the disciples take a safe place. It turns out that it's a Roman mausoleum, but it is forgotten for the next seven centuries. Then in the year 812, a star appeared above the field accompanied by the sounds of heavenly music. The hermit saw the star, heard the music, and followed them to the body of St. James. He reported his discovery to the local bishop, who built a chapel over the grave. The site became known as Santiago de Compostela, which means St. James of the Field of Stars. What's important about this story is not what the historians have been able to prove or not prove. What's important is the effect that the story has had on the hearts of the pilgrims who made the journey. Towards the end of the Middle Ages, the number of pilgrims traveling to Santiago began to decline. But it never stopped, and these days it's definitely back live. During 2004, over 190,000 pilgrims walked or cycled some part of the road. Well, the Camino goes back to the Middle Ages, when in the Catholic doctrine, the idea of sin was very important, and it's remission and one's salvation for the afterlife. Today, people come for many reasons, not only for religious reasons, but also more widely what people call spiritual reasons, that it's an inner journey. You have people here fulfilling a lifelong dream of a personal adventure, also as a physical challenge. So there are many reasons that combine together to make it not necessarily one idea at all of what the pilgrimage is. A constant in people's memories of the Camino are the friendships that they forge along the way. The bonds go beyond nationality, age, class, religion. You can start alone on the pilgrimage, but you never... Camino is a way of in, that inspires me. I want to kind of find myself. It's a... It's because of my faith as well, a bit. Well, it, it's... I don't know, I want to kind of escape from real life. When you're walking, you have this powerful sense of being led. Everything is going your way. All the pilgrims are going west. You have yellow arrows that are indicating that you should go this way. You also have those scallop shells showing you. It's very clear, this sense of direction that you have. I came to Santiago seven years ago, and I asked a favor of Santiago. He made it true, so now I'm here to say thank you. Unlike many other Catholic pilgrimage centers, this pilgrimage attracts people from all different walks of life. There are usually people from urban, well-educated uh, backgrounds who lead stressful, busy lives, and they want to go to the Camino to get away from, from all of that. There are, curiously, more men than women who do it, and the average age is 40s, 50s, and it's often uh, typical to be at some kind of breaking point in one's life. Walking the pilgrimage can be one of the most important undertakings of one's lives. And when you become a pilgrim to Santiago, you're becoming a part of a fellowship of people who have walked for more than a thousand years. There are many people who have walked these steps to Santiago, including St. Francis of Assisi and even modern-day personalities such as Shirley MacLaine. 
I'm walking the Camino because I've kind of always known about it. I majored in Spanish in college, and four years ago, a friend of mine walked it, and she sent back wonderful emails, and I just knew when I read those that I had to do it too. People are also attracted to it because of its incredible value of the culture and the art. It's like walking through a continuous museum. Every day there's something new to see, whether it be some fantastic little Romanesque, simple church in the countryside or a magnificent Gothic cathedral with 2,000 square meters of stained glass windows. My name is Paolo. I am a clown. God is great and uh, we must enjoy him uh, every day and we must uh, bring him and the happiness of him uh, to, to everyone. And so I was trying to bring my Lord through my red nose to the people. And in the Camino, everything is reduced to the basics. It's very simple. All you have to do is get up in the morning, find the trail, find those yellow arrows, think about having something to eat and your place to sleep for the night. And when you have that kind of simplicity, where everything is reduced to those basics, all of a sudden people have space inside of themselves to have time for reflection. People start walking what they call the human speed. At 3,500 feet above sea level, reaching the hill town of Sobrero is the last great physical challenge for most pilgrims on their way to Santiago. And until the 16th century, this was one of the only passages into the northwest of Spain. At the entrance of Sobrero, there is an oval stone house with a thatched roof. It's the type of building that was used by Iron Age tribes who occupied the area before the Romans arrived. In the 12th century, the Church of Santa Maria was built nearby. It contains a sacred chalice that commemorates a 15th century Eucharistic miracle. The legend states that the Holy Grail from which Christ drank wine during the Last Supper was hidden in Cerbero. A priest who had his doubts about the validity of the story was using the cup for the Eucharist. There was a huge snowstorm going on outside and only a single peasant had come up the mountain for the Mass. At the most sacred moment in the Mass, the priest began to think, why has this guy come all the way up the mountain in a snowstorm for just a little bit of bread and wine? And at that most sacred moment, the wine and the bread changed into flesh and blood, and the priest saw the error of his ways. The remains of the miracle were placed in a silver container that was donated by Queen Isabella, the same Isabella who put up the money for the voyages of Columbus. Santiago is less than a hundred miles from Sobrero, distance that will be covered in less than a week. The end of the physical trip is near, but for many, the spiritual journey is just about to begin. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolfe.